Early Bird Registration is now open for Fertility Awareness Mastery Live, and I know you'll love this program. Fertility Awareness Mastery is my eight-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the first week of May. Will you be joining us? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam, as in Fertility Awareness Mastery, F-A-M, to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 309. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. Today, I'm sharing a new installment of my Fertility Awareness Reality Series. And as I was preparing everything for today's episode, it really made me think about one of the topics that has been coming up a ton in my client work, and I suppose always does. But just the concept of of fear, of overcoming the fear of transitioning from a hormonal birth control method to a fertility awareness method. For the vast majority of my clients who are in this situation and for women in general, just the thought of switching from a hormonal method to a non-hormonal method is just absolutely terrifying. And I've been giving it a lot of thought because I feel like something has shifted within the last, you know, 10, 15 years for women. And I think what has really shifted is the message, the message that hormonal birth control is the only way to manage fertility. And essentially, if you're not on hormonal birth control, it's basically just a matter of time until you get pregnant. And so it's really occurred to me in the last little while that that message is really the source of the fear for the vast majority of women. So what I hope with these episodes is that it gives you confidence. It shows you that there are tons of women who are switching from hormonal methods every day, and it's possible to successfully prevent pregnancy whether you're on hormones or not. And not being on hormones doesn't mean that you're going to automatically get pregnant because there are many ways to prevent pregnancy without hormones. There's many strategies that you can employ. You can do this. I mean, all of the women I know have very complicated careers and have all kinds of really complex and intricate things going on in their lives. So there's no reason to think that this is something that we can't figure out. So if you take one message from my little preamble today, it's that whether you're on hormonal birth control or not, it is possible to prevent pregnancy effectively. And if you choose to use fertility awareness, it is is completely possible to combine your fertility awareness knowledge and skills along with barrier methods, doubling up when necessary to ensure efficacy. So it's possible you can do this. So if you're feeling afraid, you're in good company because like I said, the vast majority of my clients in this situation have to really cope with the fear as they learn fertility awareness and as they start to trust their bodies and all women in general, but we can get there you can get to the point where you can trust your body and do this. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. And I'm really excited to be here tonight with Freya. Freya is a member of my current group program. We, at the time of this recording, I think we just finished week seven, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're more than half of the way through. We still have a few sessions and yeah, so I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is such a cool opportunity. 
Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I'd love just to start by giving you an opportunity to share a little bit about your history. So um, if you can remember when you got your first period, what that was like, and then if you've used hormonal birth control before, and um, if so, what was your experience like? Right. So I got my period when I was 11. I remember it very vividly. It was not something that I was very, I guess, prepared for <laughs> mentally. I was one of those kids who always read a lot of like biology textbooks and was like sneaking around trying to figure all this stuff out, but still was was pretty strange. I don't really remember much about what my periods were like. I didn't like track them or anything. So I'm feeling that they were pretty normal. Thankfully, you didn't have pain, didn't have a lot of cramping. So that's a real blessing. And then when, let's see, when I was about 17, I decided to get some hormone birth control because I had just recently gotten in a relationship and I was like, need to be safe, all that kind of good stuff. And I went in and after about like 15 minutes of discussion, my doctor was like, oh, okay, well, it sounds like uh, like something that's really long lasting and has a really high effectiveness rate would be great. So without really talking about any of the consequences or potential problems, I got a Marina IUD, so a progestin releasing IUD. And uh, the insertion was pretty painful. <laughs> Didn't get any painkillers, which was probably not a great idea in hindsight. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. On the yeah. like, pain scale from zero to 10, how would you rate it? And then were you offered painkillers? I was not offered painkillers. None were offered. The pain was probably at its worst, like, I'd say maybe a six or a seven. It was definitely like a really big, sharp, like huge cramp. And I remember I bled a ton. I was actually really shocked. Like when like they pulled out like the forceps, I guess that's what they're called with like the like tissue. It was just kind of it was scary. It freaked me out a little bit. Um, so yeah, painful, not very fun by myself. <laughs> And so after that, kind of my body getting adjusted to it for the first six months, I spotted pretty continuously and that sucked. <laughs> that was not fun. I was in the middle of a really stressful school and so it was just a lot to deal with. And I didn't think much about it just because I was so stressed out and busy that it was just like, whatever, it's, it is what it is. And then I also had issues with really bad hormonal acne. I'd never, I'd had a few pimples now and then. I think everyone does. And I just started to get like really deep, very painful acne, breast tenderness, and just a whole bunch of things that like I didn't think of at the time. But now looking back, it's pretty clear that it was like not great. And then this last September, I got the IUD out, just kind of decided to get it out. And it's been kind of a slow, my body readjusting, getting used to being off of the hormones, but it's really nice. I'm enjoying it for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and another question for you, what prompted you to kind of have it out now and start using fertility awareness? Yeah, so I started reading Take Charge of Your Fertility and actually listening to your podcast. I think your podcast was the first thing that like, I was like, wait a second, I could do something different instead of just relying on hormone birth control and relying on something that I can't really tell what's going on with my body. And I'd always been a super like... Uh, really into biology and kind of like reproductive nerds. So I was like, why don't I know more about my own body? So that really prompted me. And uh, there was something that really, really big happened in my family. And it just kind of was a time of like reevaluating my life and like deciding new things for myself. So it was like, well, I can do this safely if I really, you know, like learn my stuff. And so, yeah, it's just kind of this time. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you described using the IUD, you, ha you had a few side effects. You mentioned the acne and then there was the insertion. But did you, like your experience on it, did you actually suffer from side effects more so or was it kind of overall not that bad? I 
think while I was in it overall, it wasn't that bad. And definitely in comparison to the stories that I've heard of some women, it was by far pretty easy, um, pretty easy ride. I definitely, I think one thing that kind of clouds my ability to say whether it was horrible or or okay was uh, just being super busy with the end of high school and (laughs) not really having time to think about my daily life and needs, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, But yeah, I think besides that, it was really interesting. Like it definitely changed my physiology and like sexual experience for sure, which is unfortunate because I was with my first partner and it just like, it was not good. And then as soon as I got off of the IED, just like things were great. And that was, that was definitely a nice revelation. But yeah, otherwise it was pretty easy. If you're comfortable, I just want to ask you if you wanted to tell us a little bit about the experience. Like, was it libido? Was it um, a sensation? Like, what was it about your experience that was way better when you came off the IUD? Um, it was, my libido was still pretty much the same. Uh, again, it didn't really affect my mood. And sensation was mostly there, but I just like couldn't orgasm. And that sucks. Uh, uh, yeah. has been in that situation. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, and so I, uh, I actually remember reading your book. I just got the fifth vital sign. It's great. Everyone should go read it. Um, and you know, like reading about the, what is it like 20% possible shrinkage in your clitoris and in the vulvar tissues. And I was like, no one told me about this stuff. Just, uh, yeah. So that was kind of the main, the main issue that I had. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, it's something where, as you said, it was you weren't told that it could affect your sexual function at all. There's tons of research to show why that could be. And I think what always, I guess, gets me upset <laughs> about that is that, especially for young women who are put on birth control in their early teens or mid-teens or whatever the case is, you may not know, you may not have anything to compare it to. So you may be put on birth control before you become sexually active. So you don't really know what it would be like without it. And so that's obviously a concern because you want to be able to prevent pregnancy, but it doesn't mean (laughs) that you don't want to have a libido. So yeah, for sure. And that was definitely my experience. And I will say for where I was at in my life, it was great. It served its purpose and was important for me at that time in my life. But yeah, I wish that there had been more informed consent for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I hope that this opens up the conversation because I think all the listeners who've listened to several of the episodes, especially the fam reality or the pill reality, I mean, yes, I'm sharing, sharing women's experiences, but the hope in my mind is to open up that dialogue because it doesn't mean that if you had been told could affect libido that you wouldn't have used it because it was the right option for you at the time. But it just means that if you do start to experience those things, which in your case, you know, you put the two and two together anyways, but partially because you discovered that that could be related to it. Yeah. Yeah. After the fact. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and so now you're in the, in the process of switching over to fertility awareness, obviously, and we're in the midst of our class. And so let's jump into the session part of our call today. Just let me know what you wanted to focus on. I've got your charts here. I'll pull them up so that we can both look at them. Hey, Um, so kind of my questions, I think I have like probably three or four kind of major ones. And the first one is basically, and this is kind of relating to the last two cycles, is that I've been having pretty short luteal phases um, pretty much the whole time I've recently, you know, transitioning off of the birth control. And especially the last two cycles, I've had light bleeding. And I've just been thinking about it and kind of been like, maybe is this low progesterone? But also those last two cycles, I had some pretty big stress events, like moving and taking care of teething toddlers and not sleeping for like a week. (laughs) So that I know that can also have a huge effect. So it might just be kind of a little blip. Um, But that's one. I think the other has to do with like, we've talked about kind of the wet gush sensation. I've only been having it pre-ovulation, but I have been seeing like dampness on the toilet paper basically through most of the cycle. So I was curious about like, is that potentially cervical dysplasia, maybe something to look into a little bit more. And then the third is kind of some interesting mucus kind of 
showing up post of, and we can get more into that after we've looked through some of the other things first. Okay. Uh, well, so at the time that we're recording this, you had the IUD removed, let's see. About six months ago, almost, maybe a little less. Yeah. Yeah. About six months ago. So we're to some extent in still in the post pill transition phase, mm-hmm. but question for you. So when you had the IUD removed in September, did your just, you know, did you just resume cycling right away? Was it pretty straightforward? Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. I think it took probably about a month for it to come back and I had some spotting after it got taken out, but yeah, it um, resumed pretty quickly. And then it was, uh, I'd been charting for a couple months before class started. So yeah. Mm Mm-hmm having a shorter luteal phase is fairly typical just in general for the first couple months post pill, but we are in cycle, cycle what? How many this cycles is, are we This now? is, let's see, eight cycles. I actually was wondering about that. Like, how do I mark it? Is it by like <laughs> the number in the year or number total? Anyway, so yeah, I think this is about cycle eight. You can do it you want. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, no, that gives us some information because by cycle eight, we typically the there comes a point where we can no longer blame yeah. the hormonal contraceptives for what we're seeing yeah. and that's kind of within that period of time so i'm looking at your january cycle yeah. and based on your temperature it looks like ovulation took place around day 16 cycle day 16 mm-hmm. yeah so based on that yeah the luteal phase for january was eight days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What you have marked. Yeah. So that's really short. And so you mentioned a few things have been happening lately here and there. So tell me about January. So January, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, actually. So we've, my mom and I have been moving house <laughs> for about two and a half months, essentially because of weather conditions and all kinds of stuff happened. Anyway, long drawn out only she and I are doing it. So it's been pretty stressful, physical kind of labor. And so we kind of dotted in and out. That's been part of part and parcel of the last few months. So that could be having an effect, but the, again, it's, it's hard to tell whether that's, or it's, you know, I don't know if it's that stress or not, that's causing potentially some of this. Well, and if you've tracked all eight of your cycles, what has been your longest luteal phase, if you know that? I think my longest luteal phase has been about 15 days. Okay. 15 or 14. Which month was that? That was in October of 2019. Yeah, so that's October. That's last October. Okay. And you unfortunately um, don't have the charts for those ones since they're pre this class, not in the right format. Well, I mean, if you want to, if you have them in a different format, you could shoot it over via email and I could still take a look at it. Okay. Um, I can see if I can find them real quick. I also have them on Kandara. I don't know if that would, yeah. that would help. Yeah, you okay. can just, yeah, you can just send it over. Okay. Yeah, because I'd be interesting, interested to see that because when you see a pattern like that where you come off of the hormonal birth control and then you do have a few cycles where the luteal phase length is within that normal range and then it kind of shortens up, then that's a sign that it, again, it might not have anything to do with right the birth control. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, I think the, that one that was like 15 was by far the like outlier. They've all been mostly under like 12, 11 days. So they've all been relatively pretty short. But your January cycle at eight days, was that the shortest one you've had so far? Actually, no. This last, let's see. It depends on how you count it. So that's another problem that sometimes the like peak day hasn't really, in terms of mucus, hasn't really corresponded to temperature shift. And sometimes there's been crucial missed temperatures. And so it's kind of a little bit of wiggle room. So there was, let's see, in December through January, so December 19 to January 2020, 
it was potentially a luteal phase of six or seven days, which is crazy short. Mm. So. Okay. Well, and so, yeah, I'd have to take a look. So I'll kind of wait for the charts to come through, but in December, was there anything, I mean, it's the holidays, so there's that, but um, was there anything in particular that stands out? My boyfriend was visiting, but yeah, we had kind of started moving and um, we had kind of recently gotten back from, so my father passed in, let's see, August. And so we kind of went on this really long trip to try and deal with things and we came back home. And so it was kind of a whole getting back into the swing of life kind of thing. So that's also been kind of in the background, a pretty big, I guess, emotional stressor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so, I mean, in general, the things that that we would want to look at for a luteal phase, um, a lot of the things that we have talked about in the group. So sleep patterns, want to get a sense of that, want to get a sense of your stress levels, want to get a sense of your eating patterns, because when we're stressed, when lots of things are going on, it's, you know, pretty easy to skip meals and mm-hmm. those types of things. Yeah. Unfortunately, I I do have a tendency to not eat sometimes until kind of later in the day. And it's something that I'm trying to work on for sure. It's, it's mostly getting absorbed into things and yeah, you know, the story. <laughs> I'm sure you've mm-hmm. heard it. Well, so tell me more. Uh, on those days, are you are you typically having breakfast? It's typically not having breakfast. Oh, and that's another thing I forgot to mention is that I would sometimes have nausea while I was on the marina IED. And so I kind of got into this habit of not really wanting to eat in the morning because I didn't feel good if I ate. And so I think that's kind of also translated. And for me, I wake up kind of late in the day. So again, not eating for at least two-ish hours usually that's earliest after waking up okay so then on those days where you're kind of not eating for a while and then you eat do you end up eating three full meals like if you were to add up all the eating oh probably more like two if not like one and a half Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear it even in my own voice. It's like, oh, yes, that's, that's it. Or something to do with it, for sure. And and what's your activity level like? Um, not as active as I would like to be. I typically go on a few walks in like a week, but it depends on what's going on in life. So there are definitely months where there's very little activity and there's some months where I'm going on a walk every day. So, Okay. Um, Well, and you sent me, I have like a, just from the intake form. So do you typically start the day with like black tea? Um, I sometimes do. I'm trying to transition off of caffeine. (laughs) I think in some of the charts, you'll see that some days it is, sometimes not. Yeah, it's about a 50-50 chance at this point. Trying to wean myself off, though. Well, I mean, the only reason that I ask, it's not to be all weird about the caffeine, but more so because sometimes I've seen the pattern when you're starting your day with coffee or tea, something caffeinated, Mm -hmm. um, caffeine, caffeinated beverages do have the tendency to suppress appetite. So Mm -hmm. then it kind of, you know, you wake up, you have the caffeinated beverage of choice and then you don't eat. And then it can kind of be the replacement for breakfast. And then what I found is that when that happens, it's not like you're eating like another meal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's just that breakfast was skipped. So in terms of your luteal phase, uh, one of I think obvious one of my obvious suggestions would be, you know, just to think about this aspect of life right now and after our call today and think about what are just a few things that you could do to make having like breakfast easier for you. So it doesn't, I 
I don't think that it's necessary to wake up and immediately gorge yourself on a huge meal because most people don't feel like eating Mm -hmm. two seconds after they get out of bed. I think that it's important to start just becoming more in tune with your body. Definitely, you know, have some, have some water, have some tea, like some hot water with lemon or something to really get you going in the morning just to hydrate your body and all of that. Uh, And then start to pay attention to your body and, but actually consider eating. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's something that I would like to try working on more for sure. And it's good to have it pointed out again by somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, Well, and when you're considering this meal that we're talking about, do consider making it like a full meal. So if it's a shake or if it's an actual meal, you want to have a protein source, a fat source, and carbohydrates. You want to have all mac- all three macronutrient categories sorted out so that you're actually getting some protein, mm-hmm. you're actually getting some fat along with the carbs. Okay. And think of it as a meal. And that's why it's good to wait until you're actually hungry. So think of it as a meal and think of it that once you're finished eating, you should be satiated. And just do that as an experiment going into your next cycle. So the cycle that I have right now, it's actually pretty good timing because we're pre-off here. So we have a a bit of a testing ground. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you're able to, to give it a try, then you'll have, it doesn't mean that it'll, your, your luteal phase will go up to 14 days Mm -hmm. from the previous one, which was nine ish. Mm-hmm. I can see that we had a couple of missing temps. So yeah. I'll have to kind of look at that a little bit deeper, but nine ish days. But at the same time, this is something that I've seen. So okay. um, yeah, certainly could help. So tell me then just refresh my memory. Like, how are you sleeping? How's that all going? I'm sleeping pretty well. I don't have problems falling asleep. I generally get around eight ish hours. However, my sleep hygiene in terms of getting off a screen or, you know, putting the screens away like an hour before bed is pretty terrible. I've been trying to work on it, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely a hard one for me. But overall, I sleep really well and generally sleep about eight hours. So one, well, is it, I know we talked a little bit about it because of where you live, there's often light coming in. Yes. So is, is it a possibility to make your sleep environment dark? Uh, for the most part, I uh, have like basically no lights, nothing on. I could definitely put something over the windows for when it gets light, lighter in the lighter part of the year. But I'm just kind of coming out of the winter when it's very, very dark most of the time. So the last couple of months, thankfully, it's been pretty pitch black. Okay. Well, that's good because then we know that it's not necessarily that. And so for the screens, it's, we talked about this, this was one of our topics in one of our recent calls. And so I had a few suggestions for, cause of course, like ideally we would all get off of our screens two hours before bed and read wonderful novels. <laughs> That's our thing. And do, <laughs> but life isn't perfect. So when you're on your screens, uh, have you been able to find a couple of apps or, you know, different settings so that at least you're making it orange or red or something to block out some of the blue light. Yep. Yeah. Thankfully I've, I've had to do online high school. And so I've been very protective of like constantly having those screens on a kind of a dimmer or a a kind of the switching to more incandescent color spectrum. Okay. That's great. I think part of it is going down the list of things that could possibly be contributing to Mm -hmm. the luteal phase length and then attacking them. So at this stage, I would say definitely, you know, think about what we were talked about with diet. Well, I should rephrase that with actually eating meals. <laughs> and then, so easy. Um, it's not though. It's really uh-huh. not because eating, eating meals requires, right? Grocery shopping, planning. Yes. Um, and it also requires that, that time. So uh, in order to have the food to eat, you have to actually organize that in your day, especially when you're busy and you have to fly out the house to get to wherever you need to go. I think that one of the things that you could do, like homework, would just be to, you know, sit down and write out five possible breakfasts that meet the criteria of protein, fat, and carbs, and force yourself to come up with a minimum of five 
ideas. And so some of like one of them, sure, could be like you actually cooking a meal, <laughs> but you have to be realistic because you might not have time to like fry up bacon and eggs or whatever <laughs> every day. And one could be a shake, making sure that it, it's filling the three criteria. One could be leftovers, one could be, but just actually sit down and force yourself to come up with some ideas and then ask yourself, like, is this realistic for me? Is, will this work on my busiest day? Right. And then start from there. Okay. Good advice. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So then I think that's probably enough homework for the luteal phase. And in the sense that when we have our sessions in the group, depending on where they fall within your cycle, we might start to get a, chan- um, a sense of whether or not it's actually help- helping to lengthen it. Mm-hmm. And so just a couple other practical things that we've talked about. So when you're having a shorter luteal phase, you want to find ways to support progesterone production. So that's why we're talking about eating. That's why we're talking about sleeping. Because when you're not sleeping in the dark, you can interfere with that. When you're not getting enough food, you can cause some degree of stress in your body, which can interfere with that. But in addition to that, you might want to just do a few supportive things. So we've talked a little bit in the group about magnesium. So doing like if baths are a thing in your life, doing some Epsom salt baths, particularly in the luteal phase, magnesium is known to support progesterone production. So not everyone's a bath person though. Is that a thing for you? Unfortunately, there's no bath in my house and it makes me sad every day. I love baths. (laughs) I would be taking them. (laughs) Hashtag goals, (laughs) future goals. Yes. (laughs) Well, so there's, you know, other options as well. Um, One is to create like a magnesium oil spray. It's called oil, but it's Mm -hmm. not oil. So that's something where you can, you know, add it to a spray bottle. And then when you're doing your lotioning routine at night, you can actually put it on your body and Mm -hmm. kind of organize it that way. Or you could consider supplementation with magnesium uh, in the luteal phase and, or throughout your cycle in general. And then you'll be able to chart and see if that also helps to improve the length of your luteal phase. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so that's, that was the first question. Before we move on to the other topics, did you have any other kind of thoughts around that? No, that seems to be covering it. And and yes, probably eating makes a lot of sense. Yes. Well, and you mentioned something about your temperature is not always lining up with the mucus pattern. So I'm looking at your February chart here. And so you did have some mucus leading up to ovulation. Based on the temperature information, like we could put ovulation day 14, 15, or 16. So it's hard to know the specifics without the temp. But the last day that you had mucus that was clear and stretchy So this is actually one of the ones that I wanted to talk about because I've been having some interesting like post of what I would consider post of like mucus changes. And like you can see here, like it's stretchy, but it's like kind of more gummy, like that back of a credit card kind of thing, but not quite so sticky and uh, it's cloudy. And there's a very distinct change in it, especially in this chart. just wanted to jump into today's episode to give you an update. Registration is still open for Fertility Awareness Mastery Live, and we still have a spot available for you. I'm really excited to get started in the first week of May, and I would love for you to be joining us. Make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam, that's F-A-M as in Fertility Awareness Mastery, to join us and to reserve your spot. Again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the signs that we look for. So then you mark day 16 as your peak day, which I would also mark that. And so, yeah, I feel like with, I mean... What I always say with charting is that it's short of a daily ultrasound. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting the most accurate estimate of ovulation. So, and I don't know anyone that has an ultrasound machine in their house. So there's that. I would peg ovulation then around day 
15, 16, mm -hmm. based on mm -hmm. what we're seeing here. And only because there's the two temps, yeah. uh, temps missing. So we're given a range, but for what it's worth, it's probably within a day or so. So that's mm -hmm. amazing that we can do that at home. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, even though we don't have those two temps, the temps still do match up with what we're seeing because even after the two missed temps, we do see that the shift is sustained. So the temperatures are all higher and they're consistent. Yeah. And so this gummy mucus that you've, you're mentioning, is that something that you, because I'm looking at your January chart and you didn't note any of that here. Mm -hmm. There wasn't. Is this? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, there wasn't much of it that last, that first cycle, but I've noticed it a few times, but it really came in this cycle number two in February. I will say though, that it was extremely stressed out. I had an anxiety attack, I think for the first time in my life. So it was pretty intense. <laughs> so yeah, it's very possible that that cycle is just an anomaly. Mm -hmm. Well, and have you noticed a change in your mucus? So for example, in your January cycle, you you did note some mucus. You did note a few days of mucus. But have you noticed a change from, so you had the IUD out in September. Has it been fairly consistent or have you started to see more than you used to? It's definitely changed, which is helpful for me. Um, so like this, this cycle, I'm just getting into like the kind of the uh, very stretchy egg white mucus. And there's a lot more of it comparative to when I first got the IUD out and it's much clearer. Um, the first couple cycles, I remember I didn't have any peak type mucus. It was just kind of gummy and, or not gummy, but more like kind of that creamy tacky. So yes, it's definitely been shifting more and more towards like a clear, like the egg white uh, kind of stereotype. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so it's not uncommon to see a bit of a trend in that respect. So, you know, because one of the modes of action of hormonal birth control is to change the cervical mucus right. so that you're not producing fertile quality mucus. And so it's not uncommon for it to then take several months post pill before. So all, you know, not all women are the same, but generally the trend that I see is that it does take a few cycles before you actually start to see fall into more normal patterns. And so for instance, the cycle that we, February cycle with the gummy mucus. So there's quite a bit, a lot more than you were seeing before. The gummy mucus is something that we do want to watch for because it can be a sign of cervical inflammation. Right. So it could be related to just kind of the residual effect of the, you know, removal of the IUD. So it's something that we should definitely pay attention to. And you also mentioned the dampness and wetness that you've been seeing. Here, you noted a little bit of dampness post-OV. I know you said that you were mostly seeing it pre-OV. So now that you've been charting for a couple of months, is it, are you ever dry? Do you ever have a day where you're, you would actually classify it as dry and there's no dampness? Mm -hmm. uh, it's... It's hard to remember all of them, but more recently, it's definitely been, there's always at least some dampness on the toilet paper. Um, it's definitely not lubricative and there's no mucus. Like it, sometimes it'll be like that. It'll have the shiny quality, uh, just cell slough, but there's always a little bit of dampness. And again, it's that dampness, but the kind of the gush sensation that we've talked about a few times that I've only been having pre-ovulation, but the dampness has been throughout. Mm -hmm. But you have, so would you say that you've had the gushing then several cycles? Yes. Yeah. And did you have that while you were on, using the idea? Do you remember? I don't remember, but I don't think so. Okay. Well, so the dampness and that gushing sensation is associated with potentially abnormal cervical yeah. cells. So, and there is a connection between birth control and abnormal cervical cells. So mm -hmm. when I see signs like this, it's definitely worth scheduling a doctor's appointment and, or whenever the next appointment, when you were going to go anyways, just ask for a pap, <clears throat> ask them to do an STI screen and like a swab for bacteria and yeast overgrowth okay. just to cover all the bases right, yeah. you don't have 
the signs of it, but in, they are separate swabs. So I always say, like, you know, you, a, a pap is not an STI screen. You have to, those are separate things. And sometimes the doctor will, if you ask for a pap, they'll just do the pap and they won't necessarily just do the, like if, if you're in there anyways, yes. <laughs> you may as well. My feet are already up here. Just check all the bases. So definitely have a look at that. Well, and you have the fifth vital sign. So you can have a look at chapter 11. I think that's where I talk about it. I know it's in there somewhere. (laughs) Yeah, I think I have it actually marked. It's the replenishing. Is it the coming off the pill replenishing nutrients? Let me see. There's two different sections where I talk about it. So in chapter 11, page 159, cervical dysplasia, HPV, and cervical surgery. Mm -hmm. And so after our conversation, I would say just, you know, flip there, have a read, and then it'll be like, ah. Right. Okay. Well, do. Well, so I really appreciate you being here today and being so open with your experience. For any woman who is listening to these episodes because she's currently on birth control and she's trying to make her decision of, you know, how to proceed, what, if any, advice would you want to give to her? I would say it's totally normal to feel uncomfortable and unsure. I'd say try and go with your gut and really try and figure out the ways you can support yourself as you're going through a transition if you end up deciding, because I would highly recommend coming off birth control. I just, for me, it's been a definitely a marked difference. And so I would say, yeah, if you need to read the books, read all the books, if you need to listen to great podcasts, listen to this great podcast. This is a great podcast. You know, if you need to work with an instructor, do that, but really make sure that you can have a little bit of support if you feel unsteady and unsure. But overall, I'd say go for it and uh, yeah, just just be safe and uh, treat yourself kindly. It's a, it's a hard process to learn all this. Mm-hmm. Well, and for someone who is wanting to know like what's it like in the, the group program, she's thinking about it, but she's kind of unsure if it's going to be worth it or you know what it's really like. What, if anything, would you want to share with her? I'd say it's it's definitely been useful to kind of have someone there while you're going through charting and learning these new things and someone who has a more trained eye who can look at this stuff who, you know, whereas you, you might be quite new to it or maybe have no experience at all and you won't be able to see some bigger trends. So it's useful to be able to bounce things off of another person and have their experience on your side. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Freya. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And, uh, and yeah, I will see you soon in our next, in our next session. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com slash 309. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode with Freya. Just sending out a special thank you, Freya, for coming on the show and sharing your experience. I think it's just so important to continue these conversations. And if I've learned anything over the years is that these are the conversations we need to be having. It's really important to normalize fertility awareness. It's really important for women to see actually, yes, there are women who are really doing this. This method really does work when you learn to use it and you can gain confidence and use it correctly, use it effectively and prevent pregnancy without hormones. So that is what I hope you take from this episode. Make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam reality. So F-A-M reality. And I think I also link just reality. So fertilityfriday.com slash reality. But if you enjoy these episodes, the reality series episodes, then make sure to head over to that link and listen to all of them. I'm not sure how many there are now, but there's certainly over 20 at this point, Um, possibly even over 30. I'd have to count. But uh, lots of these reality series episodes where you get to hear real women with their struggles, uh, learning fertility awareness, managing as their cycles return to normal post pill, manage as they deal with the fear of coming off the pill and how they're managing their fertility while they learn fertility awareness. So I just want you to know that you can do this. If anything to take away from it is that, yeah, you you can do it and it, it, it does work. And even if you had an unfortunate encounter with a healthcare professional that told you it doesn't work or doesn't have confidence in the method, you know, that's okay. Most health professionals aren't well versed in fertility awareness and haven't really learned about the true efficacy or the scientific information to back it up. 
And of course, if you are ready to jump in and take your fertility awareness knowledge to the next level, if you're thinking about transitioning off of hormonal birth control and really wanting to feel confident using fertility awareness as your primary method of birth control, or if you're trying to conceive and you're wanting to really understand what's happening with your cycles, there are still spots available in the upcoming Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam. That's F-A-M, fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M for more information about the program and also to register. At the time of this recording, I still have three spots available, so there's still a spot for you. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you are listening to today's episode. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.